We want to welcome all those that are watching online, especially from Lopez Prison. Come on, let's give it up for them. Great to have them with us. And so today we're going to finish up our, our series on lordship. And uh, the, the first one was lordship is trust. The second one was lordship is freedom. This one is lordship is purpose. And this is probably my favorite of the three because, you know what, I, I think purpose so many times is misunderstood in the church and uh, we don't understand how God has literally put us on this planet, every person with a purpose. You know, and I, you know, when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you begin to understand what purpose is. You know, your whole life changes, so does purpose. And I, I remember when uh, growing up, you know, there was two things that I absolutely loved. I'm not talking about people, I'm just about things to do. One was mountains. I grew up in Central California. Anybody from the Southern California will say that San Jose is Northern California. Let me help you, it's not, all right? It's Central California. Northern California is where you see places like Shasta and, and the Cascade Mountains, part of the Sierra Nevada, just gorgeous area. And I loved mountains, I loved the outdoors. And so that was number one. Number two was isolation. I loved isolation. And why did I like isolation? Because I wasn't very good with people. I, I struggled to even talk, you know, and I just thought, you know, I just want to get away from people. So I had it all kind of planned out. And, you know, by the time I was 16 years of age, I knew what college I was wanted to go to. I was going to go up north and I was going to get in to, you know, forestry. That does not mean I was going to be PJ the Forest Ranger. Okay, let's make that really clear, all right? But there's all kinds of different things you can get involved with forestry. And, and I, I had it all set. Then I got saved. You know, I got saved, received Christ in my heart. And within six months, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. Now, you got to understand, I was wired for that, I thought. You know, I thought that's what I was going to do. But then all of a sudden, God changed everything. And now I live in a place with no mountains. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by people all the time. Now, now here's the interesting thing that I want to get at. And I, I hope that you catch today. I am so satisfied and fulfilled. Why? Because it's my purpose. It's what I'm wired for. I, I'm going to say it this way. It's what I'm created for. See, I thought I was created for the other. And if I would have gone my way, would I have had some satisfaction? Sure. There's no way I'd have the same level of satisfaction as I do today. Now, wh why am I saying that? Because I think every person on the planet has a divine purpose. Amen. I'm getting a couple amens in there. I'm hoping for a couple more. All right. Let, let me read a scripture to you, Jeremiah 1.5. Now, before I read this passage, let me kind of set the context for you just a little bit. Jeremiah is a young man. All right. I think sometimes we read the, the, the book, Jeremiah, which is kind of a harsh book, by the way, because God called him to do something that was very hard at the time because Israel was in great sin. And he was basically telling them they were about to be going to captivity. And, and God had called him and he's 20 years old. And, and if you, you don't, we're not going to read all of it, but he doesn't speak well. He's young. He's like, I can't do this. But then God says something in Jeremiah 1.5. He says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you. Now, when you look at the dot, 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 it really says that he appointed him to be a prophet to the nations. All right. But really, why I put that, cut that out, because I think so many times we get this mindset that people on the stage, people who speak, you know, they have a purpose, but that's not. But I don't have a purpose in the kingdom. I'm here to tell you that every person has a purpose. Yes, amen. All right, I, I'm here to tell you amen. that before you were born, God knew you. God formed you for a purpose, every one of you. And, and I think so many times we just, we don't understand that. We don't get it. We, we think it's just for certain other people, but God has called you for a purpose, all right? And, and it, it's important for us to realize that, that um, 
you know, that, that it was something that literally you were created to do. God gave you some gifts. He gave you talents for this purpose. And, you know, even for me, I, I remember um, as, as a four-year-old boy, roughly in that age group, I had never taken and been to church. My mom took me to church for the very first time. It was on Easter. We went to a church, a little church, had no children's ministry at all. All right, so I'm sitting in the adult service and, and they're talking about Jesus. They're talking about him being crucified. They're talking about the resurrection, your classic Easter service. And as a four-year-old boy, you know what? I literally started crying. Now, I don't remember the event. My mom told me about it. But, I, but it marked me. He said, well, why did it mark a four-year-old boy? See, sometimes we look at these kids and they're going to nursery. Listen, when you're dropping off your kids in nursery, we're not just taking care of them. So you don't have to. You get a break. We appreciate the break. Amen. But, but you know what? They're being taught Bible lessons. Your kids are taking and going to, to um, children's ministry. They're being taught the Bible. Why? Because it's making an impact in their lives. It can touch them at a young age. Why did it touch me at four years old? Because I was created to do something. And at that moment when the, when the Holy Spirit touched me, it, it, it's like it pulled on that thing that I was created to do. Now, listen, I didn't take and fulfill that or even, or even answer that call till 12 years later. I, you know, I, I was going a whole different direction. You know, and then all of a sudden at 16, when I got saved and I started spending time before God, what happened when I was four came back up. And all of a sudden God said, you're, go you're going to go. And, and I said, okay. I said, I didn't have to say okay. I said, okay. And it went completely, now listen, completely against everything I wanted to do. I didn't want to be around people and I didn't want to go to flat land. <laughs> all right. But it was God's purpose. And let me tell you something. Where you're gifted and where your purpose is, that's your happy place. That's your happy place. But, but I want you to understand that because I think there's some people in this room that, you know, you, you don't even understand what your purpose is. God has something for you. He's created you. He's formed you. He's given you certain gifts. And you may not even realize you have those gifts. You may not even realize you're called to do that. And you may think you wanted to go this whole different direction. And God wants to sit there. No, let, me, let me just turn your life around. And it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Let me tell you something. I, I believe this following God blesses you. It doesn't subtract from you. Now, you see, pastor, was, has there been sacrifices? Oh, yeah. But they've all been worth it because he's worth it. Amen. But, but let, me, let me give you a couple more examples real quick, you know, of, of people who thought they were going one direction and all God, God turned around. Jeremiah is one of them. We just mentioned that one. All right. He's somewhere around 20 years old when God speaks to him in Jeremiah 1.5. All right, then we have Moses, he's 80 years old, and all of a sudden God speaks to him out of a burning bush, and he says, listen, I, I've called you to do something, and uh, you're going to deliver the people of Israel and be a great leader, and, and Mo, you know what Moses' response was? It, it wasn't like, oh yeah, it was, who am I? Come on, don't, don't raise your hand, but how many of us thought that? Who am I? And then if you look at Exodus 4 and 5, it's all about God saying, this is my purpose for you. And Moses is saying, no, it's not. And he, he gives every excuse he can think of. And at one point he says, I'm, I'm slow to speak. And some people believe that Moses was a stutterer, that he struggled with stuttering. And, he, he's, and he's making all these excuses to God. You know what God says to him? I made your mouth. I'll take care of it. And, and, and then there's another one. How about Gideon? Gideon, if you read the story of Gideon, he's in the, what they would call the least of all the tribes. He was living on the wrong side of the tracks. And he was in the least of his tribe. He was the youngest in his family. And his family was the poorest in his tribe. In other words, Gideon was about as far on the bottom as you can be. And one day an angel shows up to him and says, hey, mighty warrior. And Gideon goes, where? Because the last thing he saw himself was as a mighty warrior. Listen, I, I want you to understand this, and, and this is really important. We're going to get into some of the you know, practical side of this. But one of the things that, 
is so important for me is for people to start seeing who they are in God. To see who they are. That you can accomplish something. That you can make an imprint on, on, on society. Listen, if, if Jeremiah, Moses, or Gideon, any one of those three says no, and they take the purpose and they take the gift and they just use it for themselves, we never even hear of them. Their imprint doesn't have any long lasting effect. You think about thousands of years later, they're still talked about. Their story, Moses, probably one of the greatest leaders that's ever lived impacted the entire world, impacted history. Now, I'm not saying we're all called to that, but I believe that our lives are meant for more than just living for the weekend, living for retirement. I'm sorry, and if you're retired, I love you. Nothing wrong with being retired, but it's like, you know, everybody, it's like, let me work as hard as I can so I can do nothing when I retire. (laughs) And then I have a couple guys that I know in my neighborhood that retired, You know, and they always look bored. You know, I mean, their whole life's like, let me mow the lawn and, you know, clip the tulips and, you know, and I'm just like, cool. Why don't you do something like that can impact people? Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyway. So if they hear this, they'll probably get upset with me. But anyway. (laughs) But but I I, I want you to know this. It's so important that you, you stop pushing against your purpose. See, pushing against your purpose, let me me give you an example of what it is, a couple of them. All right, pushing against your purpose, it's living life kind of like, let me give you an example. I I don't like swimming, all right? Now, I swim because my grandkids do, but I'm not, and and I'm a good swimmer, that's not the issue. There's something about taking and having clothes on and then getting wet. It's like wearing wet clothes to me is just nasty. And, and, and it always grosses me out. I don't know. Maybe it's a weird thing, you know. But, but it's like, to me, living life is like taking a bath with your socks on. I mean, it, 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 I mean, living life against your purpose is what I'm trying to say. Living life against your purpose is like taking a, a bath without your so- with your socks on. It just doesn't feel right. You get out and they're all squishy and it's just weird because you're not supposed to do that. Let me give you a couple other examples, maybe that are better. So you don't, don't raise your hand, but you know, I, I can talk about this because my family tree, we have rednecks, um, especially on my dad's side, we've got quite a few rednecks. And, um, and, and on my wife's side, I mean, they're hillbillies, which basically means a redneck in the hills. Okay, it's just, it's, and, and so have you ever seen a redneck vet? Let me show you one. All right, you know, so. A redneck vet. See, if you understand something about redneck, they love to do four-wheeling. They love to do all these things. And so they, they will take everything and put mud tires on it so they can go in the mud and all this kind of stuff. But there's certain things that were never created for that. And when I see that, it's an abomination, if you ask me. I don't know how else to say it. That's just about as disgusting as it gets. That car was created for speed. It's a beautiful car, and as soon as you do that to it, it just ruins it, in my opinion, all right? And, and, it, and I, I'm thinking the vet's got to be crying, like, I wasn't created for this. <laughs> okay, you can put that one down. How about another one? I might touch a little closer to home, and if some of you have this, you know, I don't mean any offense, but, but listen, you know, when you take a truck, you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> And you, and you put in as a low rider. I mean, it can't even get over a speed bump anymore. I'm sorry. It wasn't created for that. Those little wheels. I mean, if, you, if that's you, good, awesome. But that, that truck's crying. I, mean, that truck's crying. I, I wasn't created for this, man. See, that's, that's what we are when we don't take our purpose and use it for God. Does that make sense? We turn to a redneck vet in a low rider truck. <laughs> because we were created for more. You know, and, and some of you, you know, it, it, it's amazing to me how much people deal with depression and sadness. You, you, know, you read stories about people who accomplish incredibly great things. 
And, and then, you know what? They, they take and, and are unhappy. Why? Because you're not doing your purpose. You're not doing your purpose. See, I want you to understand, every gift that you have comes from God. And, and somehow we have this idea, well, it's us. You know, I'm really good at this, or, you know, I'm genetically inclined in this area. Well, maybe so, but God did it. In other words, who you are and what you are was created by God. And, and we're supposed to honor God in the way we've been created. And, and we need to understand that those gifts are from him. I mean, that's like if somebody gives you a million dollars and you go around and go, look what I earned. You didn't earn anything. Somebody gave it to you. Well, I'm glad that you have this gift. God gave it to you. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, one day you're going to stand before him and he's going to answer what you did with the gift. See, I don't have to worry about ever singing because I can't sing. I can't even clap on the beat. I mean, it takes a miracle to kind of, I'm going to have to watch everybody. I don't have to worry about it. But guess what? God gave me a speaking gift. I didn't know it, didn't really want it. But I'm going to have to answer one day what I did with that. See, and, and, and he's, God's given you a gift. Now, the question is, are you going to use that gift for God or are you going to use it for yourself? Now, some of you may be hearing like, I don't have a gift. Oh, you, you, everybody does. You may have not found it yet, but everybody does. It's all different. But are you going to use it for God or are you going to use it for yourself? See, how different would the world be if people understood that? See, we have people in the earth who are super gifted and they use it for themselves instead of for the glory of God. What if Beyonce was a worship leader? You think God gave her that gift so she can, you know, anyway, I was going to say something. I'll just leave that alone. I was going to say jiggle on stage, but I just said it. So anyway, I'm serious. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we sit there, but, but, and I don't mean that to put her down. I mean, I want her to get saved and know Jesus. But, but what I want you to understand is that that gift wasn't given so she could just entertain. It was given to glorify God. Does that make sense? Well, what, what, if, what if billionaires all of a sudden said, I can serve God with my bank account and said, let's compete for who the biggest shot, who has the biggest shot? Come on. Could you imagine how the kingdom would be changed if a billionaire said, let me set, help some churches build churches? Are, are you with me? See, w w what are we doing with the gift that God has given us? And, and so what we have to understand is that, that he's given every one of us a gift. And, and, and what I want to do today is I want to kind of, I, I kind of want to break your thinking of what a, a God gift is. Because I think we think a God gift is only manifested on the stage. And, and, and so here's the way I think most, church, most Christians think in America. It's like God's gifted. He's called those people. I guess you'd call them Christian professionals. They do this for a living. They make money. And, and you know, they, they get up on a stage. They sing. They lead. And then they have their little team of, of, of Christians who... who given their life for this, and then we all come and watch them. Come on. <laughs> no more amens after that one. All right, it's all right, it's all, right, it's all good. We all come and watch them, and their job is to make us feel better so that we can live our life, make more money, have a happy marriage, and have a, a good little family. Now, what I want you, I want to shake and break that completely up because that's not what, how God arranged it. My job is not to make you feel better. <laughs> My job is to challenge you. My job is to encourage you to be what God created you to be and to impact the world. And I'll prove it to you by Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And it's, it's, Paul said this, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. And he calls them gifts. So, all right, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So when, these, are, these are the ones who are literally the voice of the body of Christ. The ministry gifts, we could call them, all right? And, and what's their job? Their job, it says here, is to take that gift 
that God has given them. And, and I want you to notice that in verse 12, it says their responsibility. And it doesn't say to go reach the lost. It says to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. What's my job? To equip you to do the work of the ministry. Okay, I think I got, I got a few amens right here. The rest of you look like, like, oh man, really? <laughs> That's okay. Maybe this is brand new for you, but I, I want you to, to start thinking differently. See, see if, if we make the church just about the people that are on staff, here's how many people we can reach, and this is the depth of it. Because it's limited by the gifts of a few people. Okay, let, 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 me, let me say this. So as, as a church staff, I don't know we, what we have, 40 people, somewhere around there, 40 people. Sounds like a lot, but when you consider how big our church is, it's not very much at all. We're actually on the very low side. I know churches the same size have double the staff, all right? So you have 40 people, and within those 40 people, we have two campuses on a Sunday. We, we literally have six services, and, and, and those six people, I mean, 40 people, excuse me, take it and make, and, and make everything kind of happen, so to speak. That's great. And, they, and there's a certain group of gifts and talents within that 40 people. But now we as a church, okay, when you look at all of our churches combined, we're, we're somewhere around 3,500 to 4,000 people, somewhere in there. On, on an average Sunday, okay? What if 4,000 people all of a sudden say, I'm gonna use my gifts? See, there are people you can reach I can't reach. See, there's people that you work with I'll never see. You know, there's certain things that, that happen in your life that you can relate to somebody else. There's certain ways that you can share or even demonstrate the, the gospel in such a beautiful way that nobody else can. All of a sudden, if we understand that we're a big giant body and that we all have a function in reaching the law, now all of a sudden we expand from here to this. And there's, in other words, there's no end to what can happen. It literally changes things. But part of the problem is, is that we have to stop thinking like only the people that do ministry up on the stage are the people that are called with a purpose, but we're all called with a purpose. And I don't come to church just to get, you know, you know to feel a little better. But I get to church so I can grow, so I can reach other people, and I can touch people, and I can help. And listen, part of the ministry, the major part of ministry happens in the church, but a lot of, sometimes it happens outside of the church. It happens in, in our occupations. It happens in the people that we touch. There's things that God wants us to do outside. So the whole purpose thing isn't just church driven. It's driven in our lives. Does, does that make sense? Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> It's all good. Some of you are great and looking at it, and some of you are looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? But let's move on. Let's go on. And, and I don't mind that. And, and I understand for some, some people this may be brand new. You may, you may have been raised in an institutional style church and your whole job is to come in and, and just do your thing and go away. You just punch your spiritual time clock. I'm here to tell you that God's called your entire life for him. Yeah. All right. So let, let's, let's give examples to help us to kind of understand this, all right? Romans 12, 6 says this. In his grace, God has given us different gifts. All right? In his grace, in his Holy Spirit, in his power, he's given us different gifts for doing certain things well. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just a few. There's a whole bunch of other things that you could add to this. But I want to go through these real quick. All right. So if God has, has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. So it's talking about prophecy and prophecy is when God's heart and mind is passed on to someone else and, and literally give a divine word to somebody. Did you know that the entire church can do that? So we get this whole thing. It's got to be this like this, this incredible, you know, 
um, I don't know how to say it, audacious moment that just like everybody kind of gets their eyes closed and somebody prophesies. No, listen, sometimes it's just you, you're with a friend and they're hurting and something comes up in your heart to say at that moment. And, and you know, you don't have to say it in the King James Version. King James Version is not the language of heaven. In case you're wondering. I know that's probably for most of us old school guys, but still. All right? And it's just talking to somebody. I feel like God's giving me this for you. It could change a life. It's a word of encouragement, a word to literally lift somebody else to, to, to help them. All right? Everybody can move in that. But I, I want to I major on the second one. Verse 7 says, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. Now, now wait a minute. Are we all called to serve? Absolutely. But some people are gifted in a special way to serve. Now I, want you to, now, I want you to hear this. It's just as important of a ministry as somebody speaking the gospel. Let me try this side. <laughs> Serving is just as important as speaking the gospel. It is. Let me tell you a quick story. When, when I, I um, my first uh, time I got to be a youth pastor in Southern California, and, uh, you know, we, we I, I wanted to make sure we had a great environment for the youth, and they gave us this room that was very unyouthy. And, and so I, every Wednesday, I, I would literally do, I would spend five and six hours setting it all up to make it look youthy. And, and I, I mean, I worked my rear end off. I'd go out and pick up kids and, you know, I did all this stuff. And, and, and I would do all that before I even spoke and I had to come in and speak. Well, our youth group began to grow and expand and, and a church of five or 600, we, have a, we had a youth group of about 130. And, and some of the adults came along and said, you know what, we, we like what you're doing here. We wanna be a part of this. And, and they said, you know what? Your job is to minister to the kids our job is to serve. And they got a team together. I didn't put it together, they did. And when they got off of work on Wednesday night, they came straight over and because they had so many people, they set everything up for me. They let me just minister to the kids and they let me spend time with the kids and they set everything up and they did a better job than I could have done. And they did every part of that service. And then when the service is over, while I'm taking and ministering to kids, while I'm talking to kids, they're tearing it all down. Now, nobody knows their name, but heaven does. Let me, let me say that again. Heaven knows their name. Every kid that got saved, every kid that's life was changed, every kid that got saved from suicide, I want you to hear this. They were just as important as I was. And we don't recognize that in, in, you know, in our church mindset, that serving is just as important. We're, listen, we're, you know, we're all part of the body. You know, Anybody here ever dressed up your elbow? No, no you're, you're like looking at me, what are you talking about? Exactly. You know why? Because you never think about your elbow. You clean it and you maybe put a little bit of, you know, con conditioner on it because it's kind of looking white and flaky. But other than that, do you ever think about your elbow? No. You put some glitter on it? All right. I, you do you. I ain't doing that, but all right. You know, you never think about your elbow, you know, but you think about other parts of your body. You put rings on your fingers and, you know, you paint your fingernails. You never go to a manicurist and say, take care of my elbow. <laughs> but you try to live life without an elbow. I mean, you're just doing this. You can't do, your elbow's just as important as your fingers. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right, let, let me go on. Let's read, let's read on. It, it says, if you're a teacher, teach well. You, know, you don't have to be called to the five-fold ministry to teach. There's people who can teach the Bible and, and they work a full-time job. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. Then, then it says, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. Man, I love this. If your gift is to encourage, to exhort others... Do you know there's certain people, they just have a gift of how to lift up people that are down. You know, I'm not sure I'm here 
without the ministry of encouragement. When I'm down, when, when you know, there was a point in my ministry, I was so depressed and so bummed out that I was ready to quit. And I'll never forget, I talked to a friend of mine and he looked at me and, and, and he encouraged me. And he had words for me. He says, you're not going to do that because that's not what your purpose is. That's not what you're called. He says, you're going to take and get up out of this place and you're going to do what God's going to call you. And God's going to turn all those things around that you're struggling with right now. You know what? I need to hear that word. Everything he said that day has happened in my life. Listen, because he had the ministry of encouragement. There, there's people around you. See, there, there's people around you that are, that are struggling, they're depressed. And, you know, and even they'll hear this word and, and, and it's like they, they just, you know, I, it, always, it always hurts when I see people that the filter on their life is so strong. Maybe it's the damage from their past and they can even sit in a service like this when the anointing's there and it's like they just, it just doesn't connect completely with them. But then somebody who has a spirit of encouragement, walks up to him, and, and they just have a word for him, and they just share. Maybe they just put their arm around. Maybe they just say, you know, I'm here for you. I know you're going through that, but you know, I went through it, and I got to the other side. And, and see, God uses certain people just to be encouragers. And when you have that ministry of encouragement, I think it's one of the most powerful ministries in the body of Christ. I believe it, t- it can take and set so many people free if we dare to take and encourage one another. Amen? All right, let, 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 let me go to the next one because you guys are going to love this one. All right, the, the next one is if it's giving, give generously. Now, let me ask you a question. See, what's interesting about all these gifts is that we're all, we're all called to encourage one another. We're all called to give, but there's certain people who have a gift for it. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so there are certain people that they just have a gift of making money. You know what I'm talking Maybe you're in the room and you're that person. Or maybe you know somebody that's like that. It's like if there's a real estate deal, they find it. They can just smell it. You know, if, uh, if they just know how to make the right business decisions. It just seems like, you know, making money is just easier for them. Why is that? It's a gift from God. It's not a curse. It's not something to be jealous of. It's to understand that that God gave them that gift. And let me tell you something. God wants to raise up more people like that who understand that it's a God gift. It's not just for them to take and use it for themselves, but it's to promote the kingdom of God. See, our church is built on a whole bunch of people just being faithful. We don't really have big giant givers. But I believe in my heart of hearts that God's going to raise up people who know how to make money, who understand that it's not about just me buying another boat, but it's about, you know what? God wants me to do something. See, we we have some huge things ahead of us like Trace Lagos. You know, right now, I'm being honest. I'm going to have to give you some news. We're putting a pause on it right now. We're going to do it, but we're just not doing it right this moment. We're all ready. But we're just not doing it right now. I just I just check in my heart. You know, when you start looking at, you know, interest rates right now and all those type of different things, I, I feel like God, I, I don't let interest rates determine what I do, but I pray about it. And I feel this check. But if somebody said, hey, pastor, I got the money. I'd be like, can you do this tomorrow? Right. You know, we, we, we had this this vision. We have this beautiful building in Westaco and, and we're using a third of it right now. I believe God wants us to use all of it. Why? To impact the Wessico area and have an outreach center. But come on. Do you guys know how expensive it is to flip a building like that? You know, the only way we can do it is when people start understanding, you know what? When God blesses me, and then listen, God wants to take care of you. We're not talking about, you know, you not having stuff. But here's what I have found out. When I put God's kingdom first, then he turns around and blesses me. I believe there's people that God literally blesses to give. Let me give you the last one here real quick. And it says, and if you have a gift of showing kindness or to others, do it gladly. Let me give you another quick word about that real fast. Listen, that, that's talking about mercy. There's people that when they see a need, they feel it deep. 
When they see, you know, families broken up, they're like, man, I, I, I got to do something. When they see kids that are, you know, are, 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 are having struggles and their homes are broken, it moves them deeply, moves them to prayer, moves them to action. It moves them to sit there and go, you know what? I want to do something to make a difference in those lives. See, listen, we have, we have people in the real Grand Valley that are hurting. And God has chosen us to be the answer. Not the 40 people on staff, all of us. If you come to me and say, Pastor, I have a heart for this. If it even comes close to fitting our vision, we're going to see how we can make that happen. Why? Because we believe that God has called all kinds of people to be the answer for the lost and the hurting. All right, let, let, me, let me move on because this is... It's, I haven't even finished. I just finished my first point. Um, don't. Some of you are like, oh, my gosh, how long are we going to be here? <laughs> it's all right. I'm, I'm going to finish it in the next five, five minutes, okay, or so, or so. <laughs> now, it, it, listen, one of the things that I have found with people is that they don't know what their gift is. And, and I, I like it to say it like this way, that, that I feel like that their gift is buried. And, and how does a gift get buried? It gets buried because of oppression. It can be things that have happened in their life that has suppressed that gift. Maybe words that have been spoken over someone. It can even be abuse. It can be circumstances. It can be all kinds of things. You know, it's, it's interesting that when I was, you know, 18 years of age in high school, and, I, and I'm born again, and I know God has even called me at this point. And uh, we had to take this test and, and they wanted to find out where your leadership potential was. And, and, uh, and so I took this test, and it, and it was to determine whether I was a leader or a follower. And when I got the results back, the results said, you are an absolute follower. You should never lead. And you said, how did that happen? Suppression. I, I, I didn't see myself as a leader. I, 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 my own identity was way down. And I... And, and it was so here's what's so interesting. Do you know what fuels me? You know what gives me the greatest energy right now in my life? Leading. I love leading. I was created a leader. But at 18, I didn't understand that. See, there's people in this room right now. God created you a certain way and you don't even see it. And how, how, do, you, how do you unbury a gift? Well, first thing you do is you pray and you humble yourself and you, and you sit there and you make a decision and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. See, and a lot of people won't do that because they want to do it their way. And if you want to do it that your way, then you can. But, but I'm, I know there's a lot of people in this room that are like, okay, I want, I want what God wants. And, you know, and I, I, rem, I remember there's a song that I used to sing. It's an old, old song. But when I first got saved, and it was something like this, it said, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll be what you want me to be. You're the potter, I'm the clay. See, it takes that kind of attitude where you sit there and go, God, show me. I, I, you know what? And many times, you'll all of a sudden, what you say, how do you know when you start getting something? It's like a desire. See, you, you don't always get a, from heaven, hey, you know what? You're called to be a gift of mercy. Wouldn't that be cool? But it doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes it's just like all of a sudden you're praying and, man, you, you have this burden for, for kids. And you're like, where'd that come from? You don't even know what it is, but it's a gift from God. And all of a sudden he's telling you, you know what what's the next step is? You got to go try it. Just go try it. You'll find out really quick if that was God or pizza. You'll find out. <laughs> You know, if you, if you get this thing and it's like, oh, I think I'm called to really young toddlers, go to the nursery for a week. You'll find out real quick. <laughs> All right? So, so number one, you got to pray. Number two, you got to just try some things. Maybe try some things you're just good at. Like, I'll just try that. It's like, you know, it's easier to steer a moving car. Some of us are standing still. When God shows me, I'll move. And God's like... <laughs> Let me, let me push you. <laughs> and, and so you got to take the step. All right. And, and then the other thing is, sometimes it's somebody speaking into your life. 
Somebody, it's, it's just like, hey, you know what? I see this in you. I, I, I got to tell this story on Pastor Christian. Christian was our videographer. His dream in life, I'm not saying he won't do this one day. I don't know. It's not my position to tell him. But, you know, his, his dream in life was to make a movie. That's his dream. That's all he ever wanted to do. I pulled him in my office one day and I said, you know, you're called more than for being, just to be in a videographer. He goes, no, nah, I don't think so. I said, no, you are. And, 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 and I said, I think God wants you to be in children's ministry. He goes, I've never really ever had that thought. <laughs> and I said, Christian, you pray about it. We started talking about children. We just started talking about children. I don't know if he remembers this part. He starts crying. I touched something that was in him. He didn't even know it was buried. Come on. One of the best children's pastors we've ever had was Christian Blake. All right. And, and not only that, not only was he a great, uh, but now he trained Hannah, who is an incredible children's pastor. Now, Christian's over in the youth ministry, you know, and he's training those guys. And, and your youth are loving him. Why? Because there's something on the inside of him. It's more than a videographer. And it took somebody to say, hey, you're more than that. We had coffee together the other day, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I know what you said was from God. He said, I still don't want to do it. <laughs> but, he, he's, but he said this, and this is the important part. He says, but whatever God wants, I will do it. Amen. Yeah, that's so good. All right. All right, I'm going to close with this. The other thing I want to encourage you, be bold. Don't let passivity or being passive steal your gift from you, okay? Let, let me share this final story real fast. King David, he's not king yet. He's a, either a youth or in his early 20s. He walks up on the giant. And basically, we all know the story of David and Goliath. Goliath says, bring me a man. Nobody wants to go. So David goes up to Saul and says, I'll take him down for you. Why? Because he's called by God. Saul looks at him and goes, um, do we have anybody else? <laughs> he says, David, you, you can't do this. Listen, I, I, I want you to understand something. I want you to hear this. There is nobody on the planet at that point in time that thinks David can take down that giant. Not, not one person, not one person, but David knew he had a call. Come on, are you with me? And now, now here's the important part. He was bold. See, if David listens to King Saul, he listens to his family, he listens to the giant who made fun of him, he... He, he recoils, he pulls back, and I want you to hear this, and the call of God is aborted. The salvation of Israel is aborted because somebody won't say yes and be bold. Now, this is a little different direction that God gave me for this than, than for Sirs, but I wanted you to hear this. There are, there are people outside in the world that are waiting for you. We get so caught up in making a living, having a house, having a car, 3.5 children, whatever it is, that half a child's a pain. But anyway. And you know, this is life. Going to the weekend, getting my boat, going to another sale. I want you to know you're called for something bigger than that. But you're not going to get it sitting on your behind in the chair. You got you to gotta get some boldness. There's people waiting for you. There's people, listen, that only you can reach. There's a ministry that God has for you. You have to make a decision. Listen, we're going to give you an opportunity. I'm not saying this is the only way. But, but when you walk out of these doors, there's some balloons, there's a table, 
There's a card. You can fill it out here. You can take it, fill it out later. But basically, it says, I want to serve. You see, what is this? It's a step. It's a step of boldness to sit there and go, God, I, I may or I may not know what I'm called to do, but I want to do something. And if you don't know what to, what to do, you, you can, uh, there's a box on here. It's a box of all different options. You could put, I will serve anywhere. It just basically says, I have no clue. <laughs> but we'll start somewhere. And, and, and what we're believing for is that you'll find your place. See, I'm not, I, I want this to be really clear. I'm just not looking for people who will just sit there and go, well, you know, there's a need here, so I'll just do that. That's cool. I, that's great. But I'm looking for people who have a ministry. I mean, and, and, and it could be building things. It could be administration. You know, one of, one of the things I, for, I think I forgot to put in there was leadership. Some people are just leaders. They just get in a room, people just lead. They just follow. Wonderful. We need leaders. Amen. You know, your gift is supposed to be used for him. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for everybody in the room right now. And I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts all throughout this room. And Lord, let that revelation literally be placed in them this, this afternoon that they were created for a divine purpose, not just a natural purpose, not just to do what they want to do, but fulfillment comes in their divine gift, their divine call. And I believe all through this room there's people that they're feeling the tug of the Holy Spirit, and I believe that they'll, they're making a decision right now in the name of Jesus to take a step, just take a step of boldness, to not let the plan of God to be aborted, to not let people who need them be lost. Now with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, you're here today and say, Pastor, I, I, you know, I'm hearing all this. I'm not even right with God. I don't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. Man, I have incredible news. Jesus loves you. He wants to be the Lord of your life. He's a benevolent Lord. He's an incredible Lord. He wants to give your life purpose and meaning. He wants to be your rescuer from every part of your life. And the Bible says that when you make a decision to make him the Lord of your life, to give him everything, you don't have to understand everything. Just make that decision from your heart, not your head. That the moment that you do that, he forgives you of every sin you've done. He comes to live on the inside of your heart to be your life partner. And you have the assurance that heaven is your eternal home. Maybe you're here and say, Pastor, to my knowledge, I've never done that. And I need to today. Or you may be here and say, one time I did it, but I've fallen away from God and I need to come back to him. Listen, if that's you, you need to come to God for the first time or come back all over the building. If that's you, just would you put your hand up nice and high just so I can see it. Yeah, hands going up. That's wonderful. Just put them up nice and high. Don't hesitate. This is your moment to make this incredible lordship decision that changes your life, just like it changed mine. Yeah, hands going up. That's wonderful. Anybody else? One last time. Anybody else? That's great. That's great. You can put your hands down. And want, I'm going to lead us out in a prayer. I want everybody in the room to repeat this prayer nice and loud. And, when you, and those who raise their hands, when you say these words, I want you to make a decision to make them the Lord of your life. Just a simple decision. A miracle will happen as you speak those words. He will forgive you. He will come to live with you. And heaven is your eternal home. Repeat after me, if you would, everyone. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus that he died for me. I repent of my old life. And I ask you, to come into my heart and to save me right now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. I thank you because of my confession that I'm forgiven, that you live in me, that heaven's my eternal home. I am saved in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give it up for those who received Christ.